Hi, everyone, and <clears throat> excuse me, welcome again to another episode of Gaudium Space 22, both on the Podbean podcast and uh, YouTube video. Uh, once again, I'm happy to be back in the saddle after a couple of months of not doing any of these interviews. Did one yesterday with my buddy Kale Zeldin uh, on the topic once again on the Synod on Synodality, which, as I've said over and over and over again, I'm really kind of sick of talking about. <clears throat> but it is what it is. But today, Today, I'm delving back into the deeper waters of my true love theology, and I have with me uh, Father John Neppel, and Father Neppel is Vice Rector and Professor of Theology at St. John Vianney Seminary in Denver, Colorado. He's also a priest of the Archdiocese of Denver, and he is also uh, a member of the, uh, I think it's called Priestly Association of the Companions of Christ. Am I getting that right, Father? That's it. You got it. Yeah. You got a PhD at Santa Croce in Rome, correct? I did. I did. Yeah, that's correct. What did you do your doctoral work on at Santa Croce in Rome? I did it on, I was sent over to do a, a doctorate in dogma, focused in on ecclesiology, and then with a director of great Portuguese um, <clears throat> named Miguel de Salis, we kind of honed in on Mary and the church specifically. And I was interested in Balthazar. He was interested in Shaven, so I did Shaven, and then made my way back to Balthazar, as, as these things go, as you know. So, That's uh, And what year did you complete that? It a 20th century study, but grounding it in Shaven in an idea that I imagine we're going to talk about today, which is this really creative move that he makes in calling Mary in the church a perichoresis. So. Absolutely. I was always... <clears throat> I have to say... <clears throat> excuse me, I'm as my little viewers, and I'm still getting over... The last vestige hanging on by its fingernails, this stupid sinus infection. But I, I'm vanquishing it with thanks to uh, vitamin C gummy bears. I highly recommend vitamin C gummy bears, by the way. But anyway, your is this book then that we're going to plug today the result of your dissertation studies? It is. It is. Yep. It is. Uh, thank you. If I yeah. knew how to do, if I knew how to do technology. I would have, you know, a link to this and it would be nice. in the background if I was Michael Lofton or something like this. But for those who are there's there's the book for those of you who are watching, for those of you who are just listening to audio, it's called A Bride Adorned, Mary, Church, Perichoresis and Modern Catholic Theology by John L. Nepple. And, and the book in the book, I, I haven't read all of it I've uh, on the trip to Rome and back. And so I got a chance to read about I would say almost a half of it, maybe, maybe I have, maybe even a little more. I don't know. I, I, I cause I jumped all over the place. I, <laughs> I just kept jumping to stuff that looked, well, this is interesting. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, cause I knew I didn't have time to read it systematically cover to cover. So I just jumped all around, but it does, it deals with shame. It deals with, uh, Balthazar. It deals with Bouillet, uh, Charles Jeunet, a much neglected theologian from the 20th century. Uh, and also Leo Shefsik, uh, is, yeah, is, is dealt with in here. And of course, the topic is the relationship between Mary, the Virgin Mary, and ecclesiology and the church. So why don't you just begin? I don't want to put you, it, it's kind of hard to do this. I hate it when people do this to me, but I'm going to do it to you anyway. Kind of, can you sort of, uh, in a sense, encapsulate the, uh, maybe the, the three or four major themes of this book for our readers, and then we can go from there? Yeah, for sure. First off, the uh... I appreciate you doing this. Uh, I just want to say I have Larry and I have had a funny couple of months together just because of health and travel stuff. I was talking yeah. to buddies out here and I was like, yeah, I'm podcasting with chap tomorrow. And they're like, sure you are. And they're like, <laughs> the second time he's canceled. And I was like, yeah, okay. We'll see if it happens. So anyways, I'm very happy that we, we got our schedules aligned and everything worked out. Today. Yeah. I had to cancel this twice, but this is much delayed. Totally on my end, I had to cancel twice, but here we are. So, but um, thank you for, for for putting up with me and and for finally coming on. Oh, it's awesome! It's great to be with you. Um, so yeah, so this book came to be. Uh, the notion, my friends say, uh, they said we tried to read the book and we didn't make it through the title. Uh, and we said, <laughs> when, when you put the word perichoresis in a title, it's going to be like this is going to sell dozens of copies. So just breaking it down, I what I was interested in is um, when I was in seminary, as you, as you know, Larry, from our conversations, I studied under uh, a wonderful Jesuit as my spiritual director and preached my first mass. His name was Raymond Goronsky. Yes. And he was from the era of the, the guys like you and Oaks and who were like doing all the heavy lifting, like literally bringing things out of the German into English and um, 
in the in the era of Ron or in these things. So so Balthazar was how I came to really love and understand the church as Mary. And that's that was the 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 focus was to say, I really want to, especially in light of all this, you know, synodality and everything that's happening and kind of like trying to navigate these post-conciliar waters that you know you're thinking about and talking about all the time on your show. I was like, how do we kind of how do we kind of sort this? And then really diving into Lumen Gentium and seeing the reunification of Mariology with ecclesiology. And then also being convinced that all of this started in Newman, Shaben, Moeller, 19th century. If we go back to them, I think we can reinterpret and dig into how do you get a Journée and a Balthazar and how are they using Matthias Shaben? And so the, the book is really a study of um, a great man who had a great idea in the 19th century and the way that played out in four, what I call the key thinkers who really appropriate and develop his idea and the way that that affected the church's vision of the church as Mary, something that has been neglected and now needs to be recovered in, in our time. So, Yeah, that, that's great too. And I, I, I can't recommend to my viewers and listeners enough uh, if, if they get an opportunity, especially if you're students of theology that are interested in this podcast, to read the works of Matthias Shaben, uh, S-C-H-E-E-B-E-N, Shaben, uh, because he really is, and, and he's really coming back into vogue these days, because he really does represent, don't you think, Father, a kind of transitional figure between the, the sort of Thomistic scholastic world and then the Ressourcement Communio theology that emerges in the 20th century. Would you characterize him as such? Absolutely, I would. And I think that, you know, uh, the 20th century was such a mess for so many reasons, you know, social politically and, and even in terms of the church. But there was so much good that happened in the church. And and we I really appreciated your, your podcast on Resource Mont is a historical movement versus communio theology and trying to kind of and where is Thomism, all this? And right after this podcast, I'm teaching my intro to theology course, and we're kind of we're digging into this stuff. We're reading Peeper and um, and uh, Ratzinger on some different things. But to understand it, it's like, and not to go into this forever because it's not exactly the topic, but Romanticism yeah. really gives birth to Resource Mont before Resource Mont. You know, Mo yeah. Johann Adam yeah. Moller, who's a petrologist in, in Tubingen in the 1930s, is, is just saying, we got to go back to if we're going to respond to this kind of rationalized scholasticism, because everybody thinks, oh, scholasticism, those are the good guys. And it's like, it was so Cartesian, you know, in, in, but, but 17, 1800s, this is not the purity of, of Aquinas and his wisdom. Um, it really had been just created into this, this kind of vast system. So Moeller and then this, this group of Italian Jesuits and Joe Carolla just put out a great book on this, the Scuola Romana. They're, they started doing all this patristic revival stuff. Uh, mid 1800s and they have two great students who come to Rome John Henry Newman and Matthias Shaben Shaben is a Shaben is a priest of uh, Cologne young guy they go back and they start writing Shaben dies fairly young um, oh. but started laying out his handbook der katholischen dogmatik the handbook his his multi-volume and these Germans they do everything in 18 volumes <laughs> Balthazar's trilogy is 16 volumes, and he said in the introduction, if you ever read this, he said, I hope somebody more competent can complete this present fragment. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Only a German would call it that. So, yeah, so Shaben is, you know, uh, right around contemporary to Newman, um, a little earlier in terms of when he's writing. But then I think Guardini, Carl Adam, there's some kind of inner war period guys who really link uh that 19th century work and then it just explodes and takes off with so much of the renewal and the revival that was happening around the resource mount movement before the council and, and carl adam i'm glad you mentioned his name and once again this is slightly off topic but it's actually somewhat on top because it's it's setting background it's setting a, a, a certain picture here uh i was a big fan as a young theologian of carl adam who i think is a much neglected figure during the early mid 20th century if you want to call it 20s 30s that sort of thing but his 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 reputation took a bit of a hit i think because i think he was accused of being something something of a nazi sympathizer or something in, in the early days of hitler right there were many germans who romantically i probably viewed him as you know like the salvation of something i don't just as like gary goulagrange saw marshall Pétain as somehow the retrieval of catholic france 
even right. as Peyton was down in Vichy, goose stepping around, appeasing Hitler, you know, yeah. was Gary Lagrange a Nazi? Heck no, of course not. But there was this political appeal uh, that uh, to go back to sort of those romantic roots, uh, you know, of, of, of king and country. Uh, that I think appealed to guys like Carla. I mean, anyway, I, I, I digress. Um, the Shaban thing, though, I think is it, it's it's important, uh, and and to bring up Newman in terms of your thesis here uh, about Mary and ecclesiology, uh, because in 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 many ways this this represents, in my mind, why race initially race source and then communal theology is, is so important, uh, because it does really represent the only real orthodox alternative to that Cartesianizing uh, philosophy and theology of, of the scholastics. The scholastics, of course, who were a classic example of reactionary forms of thought taking on the patina of that against which they're reacting. <laughs> okay, so the scholastics were all obsessed with proving Catholicism in the face of a skeptical world. So they end up with this overly deductive, overly objectified, overly Cartesian sense of what reason was and, and what theology should be doing in that regard. That's my take. That's my spin anyway. And so Shaban and, and, and Newman and these guys come along and they say, yet. We're not doing that. So, yeah. so that's the kind of uh, spade work that you're kind of doing in some ways in this text by retrieving these guys. Yeah, and I think that I I kind of accidentally like the fact that this book ever got published. It um, is because I just kind of accidentally was doing something that I didn't even realize was kind of starting to trend. Uh, just like, oh, Shaven's kind of cool now. So. Matt Levering's yeah. like, yeah, this is great. We'll publish it. I was like, whoa, because um, it had gotten dropped after years working with another unnamed Catholic university that basically devastated me for like four months. And then I finally got over it. But um, yeah, shape was uh, is everybody seeing this is important. Now, one of the last things I'll say on Shaben is that he's trying to be content, like taken as a, a great kind of uh, Leonine Thomist, and he's not. Right, like he right. loves St. Thomas, uh, but he is, he's resource mont in the sense that Journey is resource mont, which is like, it's not contra Thomism. Uh, exactly. Journey is all, he is, he loves St. Thomas, but he also loves Augustine. And so when, um, not to start throwing people under the bus here, but I love how uh, Emmaus Academic is republishing the Han book, but um, Thomas Joseph White puts out a, a an introduction, page one on, I think it's volume five, or whatever. And he's just like, this is the model scholastic. And it's like, no, it's not. And a friend of mine, Evan Coop wrote a nice, you know, respectful article saying he's really not doing scholastic. He's not a scholastic manualist. He's, he's doing something really different. It's this patristic revival. It's proper to the school of Romana uh, that he studied under. And it yeah. led the way into what we're going to see in the 20th century. So Which only gonna... goes, yeah, the only goes to show with these great figures, there's a constant battle to appropriate them to your to your camp of thinking, yeah. uh, which is a sad artifact of, of many of the you know, debates 20th century. I, I don't really care in some sense, you know, who gets to claim, you know, the legacy of a Shaban or a Journey. Uh, it, it, because both thinkers are too complex to be so reduced anyway. Uh, and I just recommend to everybody that they read them. Anyway, let's get on to your, your, your actual uh, then theologizing here. First off, tell, tell the viewers and the reader and the listeners, wh what exactly is perichoresis Perichoris. and how, how does that term enlighten theologically our minds with regard to the relationship between Mary and the church? Perichoresis is not, a, is a Greek word. Uh, meaning it's two Greek words. Uh, German is also like that. You kind of put them all together. It's like Lego blocks. Uh, so peri means to kind of move around and chorine literally means to dance. So it's this kind of very vivid term that we see in um, the some ancient Greek philosophers. It's not a very common term, but it's this kind of... It's Isn't it the root of choreograph? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Chorine, exactly. Um, and so it describes this kind of interpenetrating and relational and it's very dynamic as a term um and again not in scripture um but what happens is jesus says things that are especially in john so like you think like john chapter 10 chapter 14 17 he says things like i am in the father and the father is in me so you got the you got the, the early church they're trying to kind of sort this and say 
you know, how the hell do we make sense of this? Um, <laughs> he, uh, how is he in him? And, you know, you're dealing with all these kind of early heresies around the nature of Christ and, and uh, Nicaea and everything. And so Gregory Nazianzen, who's a Cappadocian, fourth century, is, is going to say, well, there's this word that the, the, you know, the pagans were using in kind of their dramatic theory. And it might actually be a really good way to first describe how Jesus's two natures are in play. So this is kind of pre-Chalcedonian. So he's using like mixture language and all that. And that's fine, you know. Uh, but so so he's the first one to kind of take the word perichoresis and say the divine nature and the human nature of Jesus are interpenetrating in the sense that they're kind of co-adhering in the other. And this is a way of describing them living within this kind of hap hypostatic union of his of his divine personhood. So that's where perichoresis kind of makes its way into the theological world. Then it's going to be several more centuries before St. John Damascene um, is going to say, okay, he's going to, you know, Damascene's kind of compiling everything from the fathers in eighth century. And then he says, but really this is the perfect word for that John 14, I am in the father and the father is in me. So it's the Trinitarian persons that we can apply this word perichoresis to. Um, and so Damascene is going to be the guy who says, there's, yes, we can do the Christological perichoresis, but that kind of doesn't totally catch it. What really is the fullest expression of this notion that two persons are so intimately in relationship that they cannot be understood apart from that relationship. That's the Trinity. And that's where it kind of gets sealed. And then it works into the tradition from, from St. John Damascene. Funny enough, I'm a month before my dis defense. Now you've done this, so you know, this is like, the, this is like the nightmare, you know, there was this guy pseudo Cyril. Okay. So until like literally a month before my, my um, defense, everybody thought pseudo Cyril, whoever that is in the sixth century was the guy who came, who like first did Trinitarian perichoresis. And then some like egghead in Oxford was like, he doesn't exist. <laughs> and I was like, so my buddy's like, hey, you got to like completely rewrite this section because it just totally changed. So pseudo Cyril almost screwed me on my defense, but he's he's. He doesn't well, exist. I had to do that when uh, I discovered that before my doctor defense, one of the uh, and this is I don't mean to sidetrack what you're saying. One of the readers, uh, the extra readers for the dissertation defense had told Ed Oaks, who was my dissertation director, that they had strenuous objections to Balthasar on the grounds that Balthasar, when he referred to Jews, referred them as Yudisha, which, you know, uh, has a certain negative connotation in Germanic circles. Balthasar didn't mean anything anti-Semitic by that usage, but I had to go in and rewrite oh, yeah. <laughs> within the last two weeks, certain sections of my dissertation in order to address the Yudisha controversy. And so, yeah, I understand quite well what, what that entails. A little stressful. So, yeah. So John Damascene is the guy. Um, who who establishes um, that the, the the Trinity is a perichoresis, and maybe just to like slow it down for people who might not be this isn't making sense. When we get to St. Thomas Aquinas, he's going to have that kind of revolutionary and absolutely brilliant move where he's going to define the persons of the Trinity as relatio subsistence, so that the persons are themselves relation subsisting, which is I, I just think like yeah. This is it. I mean, Aquinas, this is Aquinas at his absolute best to, to kind of put this together. You're in relationship with your wife. We're in relationship right now, but we are not the relationship ourselves. But the Trinitarian persons are, in fact, the, their relations. And so he's going to he's going to just keep developing and drawing out of Damascene and the fathers this really rich sense of relationality in understanding and defining what a person is. And that's going to that's going to work out of Boethius and other definitions, but it's going to really deepen our sense of personhood, which is going to lead to, especially 20th century, who's we're going to double down on, on that. So I just think that the concept of perichoresis from a perspective of the church, uh, and again, in the Latin, in the Middle Ages, in the, in the 1100s, it gets translated as circumin in sessio or circumin sessio. I was going to bring up that that's the Latin phrase yeah. for this, which carries with it a, a stronger denotation of a, a kind of a circular a circular dance, all right? And not just yeah, a yeah, sort so of random dance, a kind of circularity. I've lost sound here for a second. Uh-oh, what's going on? Uh, okay, don't know. I'll keep talking. Can you hear me? No? 
I can hear you now. Okay, I can hear you now. So, um, now, okay, so this is yeah, I don't know. I don't Sorry. know what's going on. Go ahead. We're back. Okay. I was going to say, this is the point in the conversation when my mom's like, okay, I'm done listening to this because this is so nerdy. But the, the, it's these kind of 12th century guys in Pisa who are going to take perichoresis and they're going to say, we can talk about circumincessio and, and circumincessio. So one is with a C uh, in the middle of the word. And one is with an S in the middle of the word. And they distinguish between active incessio, which literally means to chedere, to walk around, um, and incessio, which means actually to dwell in. So now they're 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 drawing the word even more that perichoresis, when we talk about the Trinity, is actually uh, a, an inner penetration, so active. They're actively in the other, and then there's a there's a co-adhering or an indwelling. Yeah, yeah, so like a passive thing. So it, so it even has a ton to do with just the notion of act and potency, not not potency in God, but just in terms of rest and movement. In the in the in this notion of trinitarian love, it's amazing. All in this one term, and it's all kind of getting played out in the early. Century. I don't worry. And I, I love this, and don't worry about getting too nerdy here because it's been a while since I've done a, a podcast with some deep theology, which I'm really itching. And and a lot of my viewers and listeners uh, appreciate the, this kind of thing, uh, and and so don't don't shy away from it because actually this is this is of paramount importance. Uh, in, in, in our understanding of so many theological issues, which go back to these Christological and Trinitarian roots, uh, which is precisely in their patristic context, what the, the Resourcement Fathers were, were retrieving, okay? Uh, and, and so how does this then apply to the Mary Church? So we're, we're talking here about the fact that in the Trinity, the persons are essential. It's, it's relational turtles all the way down, right? It's it's it, the, the the Trinitarian relations are pure relations. That's what defines them as persons, and and so there can be like this infinite oneness of God in the midst of of even the the distinctions between the persons because of that relationality. Okay, no. So how does that translate into the Mary Church sort of paradigm? I'll just say one last thing. I forgot to mention this. Oh, go ahead. Uh, Maximus the Confessor is the third father who's going to speak about perichoresis. Yes. And he does it in classic Maximus form. It's like totally, just totally creative and kind of way out there. He talks about how revelation actually is, is in a perichoresis with the believer in the act of faith to the extent that they actually believe. So, so Maximus is kind of the first one to actually take it and say, and when you start thinking about the order of grace, there's actually, it's not just the Trinitarian persons are in this kind of perichoretic relationship with this mutual indwelling and interpenetration. It's not even just the, the Christological natures, but even the, the believer himself, there's this kind of God is indwelling and he's using the language of perichoresis and it's again, it's a super thing that he just drops and, and moves on from, it's not really developed. But I think when you're, when you get a thousand years later to Shaban, I think Maximus is going to be a part of that because he's reading all these guys and he's working on it. So yeah. Mariology and ecclesiology don't exist as sciences at the time of Aquinas formally. Uh, that, you know, he's not, you, you think about the Sumi, you think about these things, it, it doesn't exist in the terms of a pure science, but the, the fathers had always held Mary and the church together. So this is going to be important for Shaban because, uh, and Ratzinger and Balthasar are big on these, on this big point that like, you, we think of the church as like, Okay, it's an institution run exclusively by kind of probably frustrated celibate men in Rome who are doing this synod thing. And then there's Mary, who's kind of the statue and a couple of like little dogmas on the side. Like that's kind of what she is. Freaks everybody out because she's kind of this goddess type thing that Catholics worship or whatever. And then the church is just purely masculine, hierarchical, institutional, authoritarian, and just the, the right. oppressor of the postmodern world. The perfect society. Exactly. <laughs> so like... These things got completely separated uh, in the late Middle Ages is when they really broke and our ecclesiology was born out of a need to deal with some of the kind of proto-Reformation problems. So you got these uh, these kind of underlying Gnostic uh, movements, you know, Cathars, Waldasians, and the church is trying to deal with um, these problems, Jan Hus and these types. So it develops ecclesiology, but it's just purely juridical and it's all about defending the visibility of the church. That's Trent. That's going to be that's ecclesiology up until the 19th century, in, in short. 
Mariology doesn't really even come to be until the 1600s where there's some guys commenting on the tiny little sections in the third part of the Summa. So Mariology and Ecclesiology develop separately. They're, they're really not in relationship. And that's what's so remarkable about this Matthias Shaven, who all of a sudden is just reading the fathers. He's reading Irenaeus and he's reading Justin. And he's saying, these guys are talking about and Ambrose Augustine who are saying, Mary is the church and the church is Mary in a very deep and powerful way. And this seems to have been lost in the way that we're doing these things. So he's going to, he's going to start to kind of pull this back together and use his term, this, this term perichoresis to help kind of pull it together. So I can keep yeah. going and go unless you have any thoughts. So. Well, I have some thoughts and they're related to some research I did on Balthazar with regard to, uh, Mary's subjectivity, in a sense, forming a kind of uh, condition of possibility for our own subjectivity uh, as church members. Uh, but I want, I'll come back to that later. I, I want you to, to if, if you have more thoughts on what you were just talking about, go ahead and elaborate. Yeah, further. so I just, I, this is kind of all over the place, but I just, I say that because framing the notion of Mary and the church is like, what is he trying to pull together here? So, yeah, prior to it, so I defended my dissertation a month before COVID, thanks be to God, before the whole world. I mean, it was it was crazy. I was in Rome in October of 2019. Um, about a year after I defended, um, Mayus Academic started putting out the handbook in English. And I was like, thanks. Now it's in English. I was like, I just spent the last four years doing my terrible German translations. But I, I bring that up because volume five of, of the handbook there was a Mariology, a Shabin's a Mariology, but it, what, what it was is the section of his, his Mariology section, Handbook 5, not translated, but it was translated from a guy in Dutch. Uh, and so it was a German translation into Dutch, into English, and it buried this notion of perichoresis. So I'm reading Balthazar, uh, and, I'm, and he's quoting, and thanks to our friends at Ignatius Press, they like, they have the Good translation here's probably adrian walker i feel like he translated all this yeah. stuff but all this are quote shaven i was like oh that's crazy he uses the word perichoresis went back to the shaven in the english and it's not there and it's some um, and so then had to dig in and i was like oh it is there and so i think this is this could be a project um and i'll, I'll read you a little bit about what he yeah what he says here and i'll try and explain what exactly the perichoresis is because i think it's uh and then we can kind of move into some other things, if that sounds good to you. Yeah. So Shaven says, uh, uh, let me see if I can find it. Okay, this is like a super long quote. I'll just try and take it. Go because... ahead. Do, do your thing, baby. So here's what he says. He says, in general, there exists between the motherhood of Mary and the motherhood of the church, such an inner and total mutual relationship, or rather perichoresis, i.e. inner bond and similarity that each can be completely recognized only in and with the other. Just as both motherhoods are already bound together and similar by the fact that, that both derive their fecundity and soul from the Holy Spirit and both aim to communicate a Holy Spiritual life, so too in both cases the spiritual motherhood towards the redeemed include, includes a motherhood towards Christ himself and owes its perfection precisely to, that, to this characteristic. Okay, so what is he saying? What is he saying here? Mary and the church are in a relationship that is so intimate that they cannot be understood apart from their relationship with the other. De Lubach will call it one single mystery. Mary and the church are one. Typologically, we understand this. So thinking about like uh, when Paul says that Jesus is, is the new Adam, who's the new Eve. Justin, it's like 50 years after John writes his revelation. It's like, Justin's like, who's the new Eve? Mary and the church are the new Eve. Ambrose is going to say Mary is a type of the church, so he's already doing a, a deeper kind of typological thing. And then with when you get Cal, when you get Ephesus and Chalcedon, and you really establish the, the metaphysics of Mary's divine maternity, all of a sudden this whole thing explodes. Which is to say, God is born in the world through maternity, through a woman, and that has everything to do with every time that He is ever born. Because Mary stands at the heart of the church on Pentecost Sunday as the mother of Christ in his human nature, as the church is now being born in a new way, and Mary's at the heart of it. And so it's motherhood that configures and defines their perichoretic relationship. 
And what's even crazier is that as Shabin kind of delves into it, he's saying, how are they in a perichoresis? So it's not these Trinitarian persons as the same. This is an analogous form. It's not, it's not Christologically struck, like structured. It's just these two objects of grace, you could say, this woman, this personal woman, concrete, real, and then this, this mystical kind of communal body of Christ, the church, both are mothers, and both of their motherhoods are exercised through and in Mary's divine maternity. Okay, so this is where he goes deeper and deeper and deeper. Imagine that within the heart of the church as mother is Mary as mother, and it's Mary's divine maternity, the singular fact of her existence that is exercised and operating through the church and through the church's motherhood. That's what makes them a perichoresis. The, what the, and this is crazy. What this means is that when I baptize a child, it's actually the church who is mothering God into the soul as a soul is being born in this child. This is the church's motherhood operative. And it's actually Mary's divine maternity that is working in and through the church to bring Christ and to bear him in the soul first sacramentally in the life and then in the life of faith. And you think about this is how grace works. It's always connected to her motherhood. And that's why we call her the mediatrix of grace. That's why we call her the mother of the church. And that's why Vatican II is like, these two have to be understood intimately together. We got to recover a notion of Mary and the church as one mother. So that's a lot. That's amazing. You know, I guess I'm officially a theology nerd because all of that just gave me goosebumps. So that's great. <laughs> I'm all like goosebumpy listening to all this, uh, this stuff, because I had spent there's a whole section in my dissertation from the early 90s on uh, the Marian subjectivity of the church. Uh, and and so much of what you just said, especially the mediatrics of grace and the motherhood of Mary uh, is, is just so close to I, I had an article in Comunio. I believe it was summer of 19. 96 that was really the republishing of that chapter of my dissertation and uh it was essentially the title of it, i think was who is the church in, in a sense the, the the sort of mariological uh the mariological foundations of balthazar's ecclesiology or, or some fancy <laughs> title like that i don't know what it was but this really strikes at, at, the, at the heart of that uh, and why I think that it is terribly, terribly significant, especially with all the controversies in the church going on today. First off, let's back up a second. I think it's important in the context of the debates of today to explain, therefore, in the light of everything you just said, why it was very important that the Second Vatican Council did not write as many there wanted a standalone document on Mariology where Mary would be treated as a sort of topic in her own right. Rather than doing that, the council placed Mary and the treatment of Mary within the context of her ecclesiology and Lumen Gentium. Uh, maybe you could comment a little bit on, on the significance of that. And if I could circle back to your that article you said in 1996, that's how I met you as I first found that article, because, you know, it's just like you're reading everything. You're right, but right. What's actually really important for me, um, because sometimes you write these articles and you're like, does anybody read these things? But that was that actually turned my whole focus. It was like the it, it was a it was a moment where I was like, oh, we have to think about the church in terms of persons, like real persons. And it unlocked for me Balthazar's vision, which he's just taken from the fathers. But that that who is the church? Like phrasing it like that. Who is the church? Who is the church? Yeah. And thinking in, in personalistic categories, um, that was. That's that was like, OK, this is where I want to go. So that I just want to say, like, thank you. For oh, that. thank you. Somebody one person read it. That's great. <laughs> well, you're the one person who's read this, uh, at least parts of this book. So we're, we're we're owing it to each other, paying for it. So Vatican II, um, so many things to be said on this. Number one, I'm always telling my guys, it's like the purpose of the council was not to screw up the liturgy. Right. So quit thinking, <laughs> quit thinking about it like that, because that's that's how they think. It's just like, oh, let's just let's just. Let's just open up every door and throw over every table and throw every baby out with the bathwater. It's like, this is not at all what's going on. The whole point of the Second Vatican Council was to frame an ecclesiological question. And I don't just say this as an ecclesiologist, but it was about the church. And it was the fathers of the council saying, quoting from the Gospel of John, uh, what do you have to say for yourself to the world? Church, what do you have to say for yourself? 
And John Paul II always came back to that question. I think it's from John chapter four, where Jesus is asked that. And this is what the church had to say. And so when they go to lay out Lumen Gentium, which John Paul says is the keystone of the whole project, this is everything. And they reject the Octaviani schema. So the original, there was this group of five cardinals. They must have been just forces, man. Uh, they ran everything. They were called the Pentagon. Did you ever hear about this? The Lubach? Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I love it. Um, and, and so Octaviani is one. I think he was a great man in his own way, but he just kind of laid out your basic kind of Tridentine structure of the church. It's like 90% defining the visible hierarchical structure and then 10% on kind of a mystical body or something like that. And it yeah. was just like we've been moving beyond that. The visible, there's something about the visible society. Uh, Bellarmine is really doing something so important. It saves the church in, in the midst of Luther and everything, but we can't think of just the church as like Venice, you know, the as he says, uh, or the, you know, these kind of kingdoms. So the mystical body theology, all of the or, kind of the organic vision that's coming out of Moeller and these guys in the 19th century, everything's moving in this direction. Pius XII is certainly opening things up. So they throw out the first schema, and then they bring in the second one uh, with uh, Gerard Phillips, who's probably the most overlooked and underappreciated, at least ecclesiologist. Stop can... there for a second. All viewers and listeners, take heed. Monsignor okay. Gerard Phillips, who really ran the theological commission that was in charge of really writing all of these schemata, the great unspoken, unheralded hero of Vatican II, in my opinion. So yes, oh, Gerard right. Phillips, go ahead. I love it. I love talking to you. Um, just because we think the same way. That's why it's so That's great. Right. <laughs> but he is he, this, this, you know, this giant steps onto the stage and they're, and basically they're saying we, if, if the, the guiding purpose of this is to allow the Holy spirit to help the church understand what she has to say for herself in the modern age, which is Christ, but to say, who are you? Um, we needed a, a new way of thinking about the church that was ancient. And so Gerard Phillips steps in and he he's the kind of basic draftsman and and de Lubach's council notebooks kind of give us a great view on this because he's he's right there in the midst of it. Um, but the biggest, most contested decision of the Second Vatican Council was. Do we do we integrate Mariology into the document on the church or do we do it as a standalone? That was uh, the biggest debate. Maybe the only one that would rival it would be the debate over religious freedom. That, that would have been it. Right. Well, this was the closest vote. I, yeah, I should be careful saying it. So so the Phillips schema with its insertion of Mary. So basically what happened is you have, uh, you know, it's the late 1950s, all these preparatory commissions are coming and they're just saying, we need to just keep doing kind of scholastic structures. So you have Mary, which is Christological primarily, if it is. Uh, and they're like, we need to just kind of do that. So it's going to be its own standalone thing. And then ecclesiology, which is its own standalone thing. Uh, and then they just said, we have to kind of think of them in relationship again. And this the vote was uh, 2,193 votes cast, 1,114 1, favored the reintegration. The majority was reached by 17. Yeah. Crazy. So it was a massively contested. They did a second vote when they had it all kind of worked out. And it was <clears throat> like 95%. Everybody was in. But at first it was... Uh, and again, what were they trying to do? They were trying not to dissolve Mary into the church or to de deny her Christological foundations, because Mary has to be understood primarily as Christ uh, in relationship to Christ. And then secondarily in relationship to the church, but they're not separate. If you think of the church as his body. See, this is important because the opposition to in, in simply talking about Mary it, in terms of Lumen Gentium and Ecclesiology. The opposition wanted to say that's a kind of Protestantizing move that you're doing right there, because what you're they 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 saw it as a slippery slope. Eventually, then what's going to happen is like you just said, Mary's just going to get subsumed into the church, and so the focus is going to be on the church, and no one's going to why talk about Mary anymore. Let's just talk about the church, and so they were just worried she was going to get eclipsed. Right. Yeah, I think that, you know, the ecumenical movement is happening and there's a sense of like, are we just trying to dumb her down and kind yeah. of bear her in the church, which frankly does happen after Vatican II. So it wasn't wrong. It, it just it, it, the, the problem wasn't the doctrinal formulation. The problem was people actually wanted that. So they used it to say, yeah, let's, let's see. This is a terribly. Imp yeah, this is an important point and it's a sidetrack, but we're on Vatican II. So let's talk about this just a bit. 
the, 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 the sort of scholastics were in, in many ways wrong about many things. Uh, but some of the things that they were afraid of happening were not wrong. Right. And, and so, for example, in the debates over religious freedom, the debate wasn't so much whether or not the church should recognize religious freedom as some kind of a right. We could nuance that. They all understood that. The, the fear was in the cultural context in which we live. That's just going to be interpreted as, well, every relig religion is the same. So a kind of indifferentism. So their fear was indifferentism. And that's exactly what we got. Right. Uh, and so anyway, that's a total non sequitur side comment. But it's just my it's I'm so usually critical of the scholastics. I need occasionally to, to prove that I'm not a complete jerk with regard to this. It's, it's so important. It's so important what you say, because um, the temptation now is to say, the reason why this is just one of the arguments that I think has to just be really addressed is that racehorse Mont is basically sloppy theology. It's just bad scholastic. It's bad scholasticism. Um, it's just it's unclear. It's vague. It's kind of quasi modernistic. And that's what the Second Vatican Council decidedly chose to write all of these documents in, which is why it went off the rails after the council. It was just set up for that. It was just a softball pitch to, to progressivism. And so what we need is now we have to reinterpret everything according yeah. to the, the beautiful order and precision and clarity of scholasticism, which despite its order, beauty and clarity, you can't interpret Vatican II in, in a scholastic framework. You can't do it. And no. so you either have to say the whole resource mod project is a mess and therefore kind of sh shipwreck Vatican II, or you got to say maybe something else was at play here. Maybe there was... Uh, a, a kind of zeitgeist after the council where all of a sudden Skilebex and Rahner and Kuhn, who were all parity right at the council, these guys were there. I know that freaks everybody out, but it's like they were doing important work and they were saying good things, but then everything just gets, goes nuts. And we start, they, they start appropriating it. And one of the factors of this and kind of bringing it back around is that Mary really does disappear. Um, yeah. Dulles yeah. refers to a Mariological winter after the council, which is like, and Pius oh, look, uh, look oh, at age 65, yeah. I grew up after the council and yeah. I just, I mean, I, the phenomena, for example, of priests telling people to, to throw away their rosaries and things like that, that Marian piety was out the door. Now, uh, that was very real that happened. And it, it wasn't just the eclipsing of Mary. It was, there was an aggressive attempt to expunge Mary and piety from the church almost entirely uh, in some circles. And I think that Paul VI saw it and he was trying to respond to this. He had, he had documents on it. He had declared Mary as the mother of the church afterwards. And then of course, John Paul II is just like right at the heart of everything. Um, and what are they doing? Well, like everything, John Paul is just like, and, and this is Aquinas's, Aquinas's Mariology is very sober um, in the sense that there's so much medieval excess. You got, it's just the world of troubadours running around singing these kind of hymns to the bride of God, you know, and it's just, and Aquinas is just kind of like, okay, let's just stay focused here on, she's a Christological reality. Her primary fact is that she is mother of God. It's not all these kind of lofty titles and names and everything like this. He's just very much so doing that. So the gift that scholasticism gives is the Christological grounding. Yes. So what it cut off, not Aquinas, but what it cut off was the Mary Church relationship, which is primarily a typology. Yeah, yeah. And so you lose. And so if you don't have a resource methodology where you're reading the Father, you're reading Scripture in light of the Fathers primarily. You 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 cut off the the very method the Fathers are doing theology is typology. Like this is what they're doing. They're they're yeah. giving homilies, and they're like, oh, this fits together here. Um, they're not doing a science. And that's okay to think scientifically. And it gave us great levels of precision. But just to, but to see one of the limitations of creating a science of Mariology and ecclesiology, they got separated. And the fathers had a, had a kind of overarching wisdom that was steeped in revelation that said, no, we have a fuller vision of what the bride is. And that's where the 20th century guys step in. Yeah. Especially, I love that you mentioned Bouye this summer because and then Shevsik, nobody knows who Shevsik is. We can talk about that if we have time. But Bouye is we do. one is definitely overlooked. And uh, man, is he amazing. Just 
Well, okay, but uh, before we get to, I want because I want to talk about Bouye very much and Balthazar and Chefsick and all these guys, and we do have time. Uh, uh, we've only been at we haven't even been at this in a full hour yet, I don't think. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, it's it's very very important to understand. I think that resource month theology did represent, and it's turned to the fathers, a, a, a turn towards a kind of theology more rooted in the symbolic, the poetic. Uh, the mystical, uh, the typological, those sorts of elements. And, and it did represent a certain move away from a kind of scholastic precision. And, and I think, but I think it's important to point out that doesn't mean fuzzy thinking. It's very important to, that's precisely part of the problem. The problem being the, the forgetting of the fathers and the privileging of only a certain kind of very deductive and rationalistic theology. And you see this language in the 20th century, that scholastic theology alone represents scientific theology. Anything other than scholastic theology might be OK, but it's not scientific. Uh, and, and according to the definitions of, of a scientia by the scholastics, I suppose that's true. Uh, but in many, many ways, it was a it was a truncating of the theological project. So if, if, if and like you said, I mean, the, the, the traditionalists often accuse Vatican II of having all these ambiguities that the progressives later exploited. They're not ambiguities. It's just a different way of theologizing that needed to be retrieved. And did it carry within itself certain risks? It certainly did. But as the entire history of the past 300 years shows us, the scholastic, the scholastic project carried within itself certain risks which was an over Cartesianizing of things. So anyway, uh, enough of that, because I want to be sure I get this rousing defense of, of race source mon theology in there and then later communio theology. Let's move on. Uh, what? Because your book does deal a lot with then, OK, the, the treatment of this theme of Mary Church uh, in Bouillet, Balthazar, uh, Leo Shevsik and, and, and one other. Um, got to figure Journey, journey. So let's start with Bouillet, because I've been lately on a Bouillet kick. OK, what what does Bouillet's contribution and brilliance in, in this regard? Uh, that's a great question. I think that. Um, well, first up, so uh, Dr. Chap did for our listeners here. You came in and, and had an amazing couple of days with the companions. We zoomed you in. Yeah. We we're in our summer conference. We were in a barn in Pagosa Springs and you were spared glamping and were able to be at home with your lovely wife on the farm and rest <laughs> while you were recovering. Uh, but you, yeah. I asked you a question that has been stu has stuck with me. Your answer stuck with me the last few months, which was why Balthazar? Why is he the lightning rod? Why does everybody hate him? Uh, and you said, it's a bit interesting. You said he's the only one who's got the kind of total vision, who's kind of writing on everything. Like it's, it's kind of a comprehensive, and systematic, I mean, Balthazar would die if you heard me call him systematic because he's not, in, he's intentionally, yeah. not, but, but just this kind of overarching thing, he hits on everything. Um, and you said Bouillet is the only other guy who does that. And I thought that was very interesting because D De Lubac's projects are kind of specific and kind of delineated. Uh, Topical. Rapsing, yeah, exactly. Uh, but these guys are doing kind of massive things. So I, the section on Bouillet that I, um, I talked about, it. I talk about it as, I mean, he really, the way that he, he, uh, he describes it is as anthropology, sociology, and cosmology. So he's doing kind of massive, when he's thinking about Mary and the church, um, those were the kind of three kind of frameworks that I divided up the question. His basic interest is to understand Mary as an eschatological icon. And it's, so it's an iconographic, very poetic vision of how Mary is the church and he applies the perichoresis of Shaven. All these guys are, are referencing Shaven and either developing him explicitly or implicitly. And that's kind of what each each of the, the four chapters with the four 20th century thinkers uh, lays out. And if you know Bouillet at all, he's very much so Lutheran pastor who grows up, meets Bulgakov, has this kind of crazy orthodox conversion and, and then ends up becoming Catholic. He's an oratorian and he's just got um, a very uh, Deep, deep, deep uh, sociology that he gets from the East. Um, so he yeah, he's, he he's thinking about wisdom all the time. And Mary uh, created wisdom, uncreated wisdom, these kind of different things. Uh, and he is just um, such an incredible, uh, an incredible depth to him. And so uh, his Mariology is, is centered around that kind of Eastern eschatological 
iconographic vision of the church and that'll be that'll be how, how he frames it and i think it's really important to point out to the listeners that bouillet was a convert um and and that was very significant to balthazar i can't remember the article in which this appeared but towards the end of the article, it was in communio somewhere towards the end of the article balthazar is in a sense categorizing himself you know there's the scholastics there the, there's the resource mont guys and he places bouillet in a different category from resource mont uh he places him in the category of those uh, people who have converted and and therefore are Catholics who have a very keen sense of the Word of God, uh, and, and the role, the regulative role it plays in theology. And Balthazar actually says that he has more affinities with that approach to theology. And here maybe his friendship with Karl Barth is coming out as well. More affinities with that kind of theology. I just thought I, I don't know what to make of that. I just thought that was a very fascinating, almost throwaway line that yeah. Balthazar has about Bouillet's theology as being the theology of someone who has a real keen sense of the word. Right. Anyway, go when ahead. I think about, when I think about like the, the Vatican, Second Vatican Council, because uh, I teach ecclesiology here, and one of the things is to get these guys to actually give a crap about ecumenism. And I, I don't blame them at all. <clears throat> because it's just it's like, I'm going to sit around with a bunch of kind of Anglican priestesses and we're just going to share our experience and, yeah. I don't know, like eat bonbons. Oh. They're like, that sounds awful. And I'm like, think about Bouillet. And we read Bouillet because if, if there's one person, if you're hearing this and you're like, yeah, I'm not really interested in that, but you read him on the word of God and how he understands Luther, it's not selling out or dumbing down anything. Bouillet has one of the most robust Mariologies of the 20th century. So it's not just like, oh, you're, you're a Protestant kind of convert. So you got, it's all less, but he thinks about things in a, in a deep, different way. And he's right there at the heart of the council working on oh he really it. is he really is and uh, i'll give a plug for a, I, I i understand that angst towards ecumenism as well i mean i i, I feel it in my own bones like why even bother i mean because now you're dealing with factions of certain forms of protestantism that in my mind are, are not even christian anymore uh that there is some sort of strange syncretistic amalgamation of paganism secularism christianity feminism you know it's just some weird admixture of all kinds of garbage the worst elements of but there are still uh you you find that kind of stupidity in catholicism as well and and the fact is there are still deep reservoirs of profound christian discipleship and theology in in the protestant world i have a friend uh basically i met through my blog and facebook but i met him in rome emil anton who's uh, a guy from finland and, and he's a very interesting guy because he's deeply involved in the ecumenical movement in Finland. And the fact of the matter is, it, the, the reason for that is there's a strong Catholic sort of minority in Finland, but there's also a very robust still Lutheran sort of revival uh, among Finnish theologians who are very sympathetic with, with Catholicism and the fathers and so on. That's the kind of Protestantism that still exists out there. And we need to take that, that, very seriously. And, and thinkers like Bouillet, especially in his Mariological development, can really be a kind of bridge between those two worlds, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so he's definitely worth reading. I recommend, you know, uh, his memoirs, but also just uh, his books were kind of out of print in English, but most of them have been translated and uh, they're starting to kind of come back, I think. It, um, oh, yeah. I, I highly recommend his book, The Church of God, which was always uh, one of my favorite works of his. I mean, one of the complaints about Bouillet is that he he can be very difficult to read. Um, uh, like his book on the Father is is you know in the Trinity is is. <laughs> I remember when I first read it, I thought, wow, this this is a lot more dense than I thought it would be. Um, but he's he's well worth the read. Now anyway, let's move on. Okay, so because we are maybe coming up against some time constraints here, I don't know, uh, but. Uh, Let's move on then to let's skip all the Zarfrex. Let's talk about Journe. What is Journe's contribution in terms of the Mary Church typology? Journe has this beautiful line. I just wanted to pull it up here where he says, uh, Tout église et Mariel. So the entire church is Marian. It's kind of his, his line. Um, the entire church is Marian. So when you're thinking, so he, so Journe is going to approach this as a, as a Thomist and as a son of St. Augustine. So he's going to be very much so interested in. The Holy Spirit as the soul of the church, um, 
but he's also developing Shaban's idea that Mary really is like the heart of the church. Um, and, uh, but he's going to think about according to the theology of grace, which is amazing. And so uh, what Jornet does is he's still operating in kind of a, a, a scholastic structure very intentionally um, where he, and not to go into this too deeply, but uh, basically, you know, when you start thinking about things in terms of an Aristotelian science, you think about it in terms of causality. So you're yeah. just going to think about the church. What is the church? What is the materials? What is the formal? What is the efficient? What is the final cause? And then you develop it. What's interesting is that um, Bellarmine had the hierarchy in the formal causality of the church. And Journet's big move was to say, no, 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 Mary, Mary is the formal. And so he develops yes. this, like, he really, and he says that, yeah, the hierarchy belongs in the, within the efficient causality of the church. So the synod is something that is, God willing, hopefully helping people to uh, bring about the, the, the kind of Christological transformation of the world. Like that's the goal of the hierarchy is to, is, is to do It's that. not, that's not but what the synod is about. <laughs> Friend of mine said that the only don't, thing don't drag me back into synod. I know, okay, all right. <laughs> Please. I won't. I'll save that for later. Um, but Mary as Mary as the form as the formal cause of the church. This is what this is what the church is supposed to look like. And so he's going to be very interested in the language of prototype that Mary, the church is there in Mary, and he's going to focus on her grace. And I like pairing Journet with Balthazar because Journet is very much so the objectivity uh, of the Immaculate Conception. That there's this singular grace that's given to this one woman, and there's a totality and a wholeness. And a simplicity to it, and that's the church. And he's going to he's going to lay this out according to uh, how the Holy Spirit indwells in Mary in this kind of bridal relationship. Balthazar is a compliment to Journet because he's all about the subjectivity. He's fascinated in the fiat, which he calls the Catholic act. You want to be Catholic? Fiat. That's what you do. It's a full receptivity of God's self disclosure and gift. And so, if gift and it's very Jesuit, by the way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So he's going to be saying uh, Mary's fiat, but the fiat and the Immaculate Conception play together as God's initiating self-gift in grace and then Mary's total receptivity uh, and gift of self. So, Well, I, I think that's important. When I say Jesuit, I mean Ignatian in the yeah. sense of that Ignatian desire to, to build indifference to our own desires in order to be open, totally open to God's will. That's a very Marian disposition. Yeah, I mean, and Balthazar is going to do a lot with that. He talks about oh, yeah. uh, existential pliability is this great term where the soul is just malleable. And, and again, it's it's very Ignatian. Uh, and he uses a German word, Gelassenheit, uh, w which means a kind of just submitting. Uh, right. th th this represents sort of Mary's sacrifice at the foot of the cross, where she just, in a sense, wills to go along with this thing that she basically doesn't doesn't completely understand it's like a loss it's a letting go it's it's just turning yourself completely over to the will of god yeah I, I i think about kenneth schmitz who is probably of your kind of era and his book on creation the, creation the gift which is so incredible just this little lecture but it was a lecture at marquette i believe oh man it was unbelievable so just but thinking about the logic of love so the trinitarian logic of love which is this interplay between gift and reception this is all playing out in Mary as the spouse, as the bride, because as St. Thomas says, when Mary offers her fiat, she does it on behalf of the whole, of all of creation, everything. So my, the failure of my fiat, as I'm sleeping through holy hour this morning, uh, which is, <laughs> and I was leading, I was leading it and I'm schnozzed out of the guys are like, let's go. Morning, that's that's called, that's called centering prayer. Holy yeah, sleep. Yeah, exactly. But my lack of fiat today to receive reality as it is, uh, Mary, it's already there in Mary. And so the church cannot be destroyed. And, and, and I've been trying to tell people this in light of all the, the madness of late of just like the, when the church is Mary, there's a solidity because she receives God totally. And his presence in the world happens through her. Yes. Through her fiat and through her maternity. And, and, and so I think that, um, Journey gives a really good grounding and grace on that. Um, I, 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 and, and he's also kind of trendy because he's like a cool Thomist, you know? Uh, oh yeah. Which is cool. yeah. But, but he's all Augustine as well. It's, it's I mean, there's a reason why on the feast of the Immaculate Conception, the reading is from the Annunciation right. in, in the gospel of Luke. 
yeah. and the focus is I, I used to tell my students, for example, um, it's very interesting in the scene, the angel comes to Mary, right? And then there's this conversation, this back and forth, how can this be? Well, X, Y, Z is how it's going to be, blah, blah, blah. And then Mary says, okay, behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it done unto me according to your word. And the very next line, very short, very terse, it says, and with that, the angel left her. Yeah. yeah. And, and the point is, that's what, that's what the angel was waiting for. All yeah. of eternity, the entire divine realm, all of earth's history is waiting breathlessly for the answer of this little 15 or 16 year old young woman in Nazareth, yes or no, thumbs up or thumbs down. And she gives it two thumbs up, you know, and, yeah. and the angel goes, boom, that's it. That was the whole point to the scene. I think so. Therefore, when you're talking about journey here, and, and then Balthazar wants to emphasize the subjective element. I think what we're seeing is, is that, like you said, Balthazar builds on journey to develop that Petrine versus Marian typology the petrine is that objective efficient causality the skeleton yeah. and mary represents that subjective holiness in the church absolutely that's that's right on that might be a good lead into um Shefsik, who okay. was a contemporary of ratzinger they were classmates he was a couple of years ahead of i mean Shefsik got caught up in this in this kind of some of the world war ii stuff was like people were just so displaced so he was a prisoner of war because he lived in what was poland uh Silesia, I think is the name of the area. Silesia, and, yeah. Silesia, yeah. And so he ends up in, in Munich and he studies with Ratzinger and they become friends. And, you know, I think Shefsik was the guy that Ratzinger was calling in the 80s. And there's like some kind of dubium on Mary. And because he was amazing. He was made a cardinal before he passed 2005. Um, incredible man. Absolutely humble. He just taught dogmatic theology in Germany. I came through him because I think he was friends with some of the the opie dopey guys that I was studying with. So Opus Day, you know, they're like, what's uh, chef sick? And I was like, okay. I haven't heard opie dopey in a long time. That's great. Thank you for yeah. that. So, but there's no chef sick in English, unfortunately. Very, very little. Um, a remarkable like I'm very, I'm not that familiar with him because I just didn't have time to go in and wade through his German. I've only read about him from others like you. My sense is that he is, he was a close friend of John Paul, very close to Ratzinger. I think he was very influential in the writing of Redemptorus Mater, um, when I see the Petrine Marian perichoresis is at, or the, it's not used the word perichoresis, but it's in the catechism. Like what, what you were working on and developing out of these kind of personalistic, because what the, the whole notion of a personalistic ecclesiology is that like the church is grounded in persons. It's not right. just kind of abstract institution that just kind of comes to be in the middle ages, but it's like that it, the institution serves the personal reality and, and there's this constellation around Jesus Christ who was a yes. real man in a real family with real friendships. And this was the foundation of the church. That's a Balthazarian term. I was just going to bring that up. One of the most neglected aspects of Balthazar's theology along these lines of the personal categories of things is that he developed what's, what's called the Christological constellation. And so that every single figure that you see in, in the gospels that has some kind of a relationship with Christ is a kind of type for people in the church for all time, that the, 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 there's a reason why all of these people are in the New Testament, because they represent this constellation of persons around Christ, whose subjectivity, in a sense, carries on in the church in various ways. And of course, the Marian subjectivity is more than just a type. It's, it's actually ontological. It, it forms a kind of ontic foundation for our own it's why we have to get through Christ through Mary, why our piety has to be Marian, because we have to develop within our soul the same fiat, the same receptivity to grace that Mary had. We, had to, we have to take on her subjectivity, which is the subjectivity of the church as bride. Uh, it's, it's complex because the church is both body and bride. As body, she is the body of Christ, and she's more reflective of Christ as her head. But then there is that subjective Christ as uh, the church's bride. And you deal with that. So anyway, yeah. uh, go ahead. Oh, I, love, I love it. I mean, there's so many things in there. But yeah, it just it just reframes the whole way we think about the church, which is that I become more pers a person in the church. This is big for both of us. Like, the church personalizes us. Many people think it just depersonalizes because they think of it as this kind of hierarchical institution. But it, it, it's the place where we become more of persons because that's what grace does and that's what it facilitates and so the, this is really grounded in person and i always tell people like balthazar you want to okay everybody wants to read you know dare we hope and fight about that but i'm like set that aside read read his yes. 
read the Christological Constellation, which is in the Office of Peter and Structure of the Church, because Shevsik's going to take that and he's going to say uh, the Marian and the Petrine are actually themselves in a perichoretic relationship. So he's going to go even further to kind of develop this thing and say yeah. there really is this kind of deep, deep sense where Peter needs the Marian and Mary uh, is there for Peter because Mary's the one who stands at the foot of the cross when all of the apostles have abandoned, even, even John, they all abandoned him and fled. So Mary is there offering her silent fiat on behalf as the church, on behalf of the church, as on behalf of the apostles. It's only through that that she's able to receive Peter back into the church and kind of restore him to his office. And so has there ever been a time where we need Mary more? I'm sure there has been. But man, I look at it now and I'm just like, we got to keep her right at the heart of everything. What do you mean when you say John fled the cross too? Because wasn't he at the foot of the cross when What's Jesus said? This is a Goronsky uh, kind of glossing on things, but because it says that I forget which gospel account says they all abandoned him and fled. It and does. So, so John would have run, but came back. Yeah. And okay. The golf is our John is the one that mediates the Marian and the Petrine. Right. Right. Just the contemplative, uh, the contemplative masculine, but the one who has really appropriated the Marian. Because I look at the guys and I'm like, we got to be more Jovanine in the church. We, this has to permeate the because all that is is the Marian part of the church being lived out in men, uh, and especially men who are in office. This has to be the case, and I think that's what Balthazar is always pointing to. So, yeah, it's very, very interesting. Goronsky, man, he was my my dear, dear friend Rodney Hauser, who you've met. Uh, Goronsky was his dissertation director yeah. uh, when Rodney was at Marquette, and unfortunately, Goronsky, like my director Ed Oaks, uh, died of cancer. Uh, many years ago now so the the giants those jesuit giants uh they're just they're just not around that much anymore i'm assuming there are some few but uh not from my generation anyway well, this has been go ahead i just want to say as a closing comment you're carrying the torch those giants it's it's heartbreaking to see first the balthazar ratzinger i mean i i felt an, a physical ache for days when ratzinger died because i felt like this is the end yeah I wrote that in Catholic World Report, you know, that yeah. in terms of reporting on his funeral, there were, there was a real sense of sadness in my soul that uh, as, as they were carrying his body through those giant doors of St. Peter's to, to be buried and to, in a sense, become invisible to history. Uh, I just had this sense, this represents the complete end of an era yeah. that something that the, the age of the giants is over. Yeah. Uh, with, with his passing. I hope that's not true. I hope that was just not, I hope that was just me being nostalgic about the men that were so formative in my life now passing away, that, that there is a new generation arising. People like you, Father, rising up. You I know. want to say thank you for what you're doing. And just to quote, uh, I'll give you a little Gronsky vignette as a final word, because there is something about it. The age of the giants has, the, we're just never going to, none of us were formed in that world. I mean, it's, it's yeah. unbelievable to think. But, you know, Balthasar writes at the end of his uh, great trilogy, he says, this is nothing but um, uh, a bottle thrown from the Western ship of, a message in a bottle thrown from the, the sinking ship of Western civilization. <laughs> and Gronsky used to say that bottle washed up on the Jersey shore where he picked it up and he brought it and you're doing the same thing. So Well, thank you for that. But, uh, you know, I think it's important that we're all involved in this project because I say to people, you know, if you know church history, it is definitely true to say that there are certain eras of the church where you can clearly see that there was an explosion of theological flourishing and creativity. The fathers represent that, and Augustine is in that era. And then there are a few figures between the great medieval thinkers, you know, a, a Damascene and people like that. But really, then you wait until the great explosion again amongst the, 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 the medievals. And then once again, between the medievals and, say, the 19th century, there are obviously some great theologians thrown in there. But it, it's not that period of great flourishing and creativity. That I, I really do believe, therefore, that beginning with Newman and Shaban and people like that in the 19th century on through the 20th set represents, once again, a, one of the greatest explosions of theological creativity, one of those seminal theological moments in the church's history. And therefore, when people say, oh, the race source month, guys, that's so old, that's so 60 years ago. That's, uh, yeah, yeah, that's like saying Aquinas is so a thousand years ago. There's a perennial quality to what these men did that we need to be about, not just simply expositing their thought, but taking up their cause, 
taking and, and so I want you know your book here represents a wonderful way of taking up their cause and I can't recommend it and I'm not even done with it yet but it's certainly I'm going to it's a wonderful read a bride adorned Mary Church perichoresis and modern Catholic theology and may you write many more books father I hope you have some projects floating around in your head I do for sure. I do. And uh, I'm loving teaching yours as well. The guys uh, really took to uh, confessions and I, I yell at them in class. and say, reject the binary, reject it. <laughs> <laughs> and we're, we're not talking about gender binary yeah, either. Yeah, exactly. Uh, before we get off, I can't, I always like to ask this question when I'm talking with seminary people. So what are vocations like in Denver and in the seminary and, you know, the dioceses that send their guys there? Vocations are down nationally and they have been for about a decade. So everybody's feeling the crunch right now. And the, the, the temptation in seminary work is to do the kind of hungry, hungry hippos thing, just like grab every diocese you can and just like everybody in. And instead, I think that we're, we're starting to actually get to a point where it's just like we got to just work together. Um, the, the, the challenge that faces the next generation of priests is, is it's just, it's getting so aggressive and so intense and the, and the struck, and I could go on this forever. So I'll, I promise I won't, but the structures at play are still, this is still Christendom where we just have these kind of, you know, we'll give you a little castle. You got to live by yourself, but you know, th then you'll be fine. It's like, this is, so we have to radically recast the way priestly life is lived. And I think that's our primary that's my primary interest and uh, in getting down to the, the real human formation that is at the heart of it. So in Denver, things are good. We have a healthy presbyter. We've had three bishops who are great men who are faithful to church and they draw normal faithful guys to be priests like myself. Charles Chappie, I was playing racquetball with him when I was 18. I was like, this is a man I'll follow into battle. So uh, yeah. So we're really blessed here in Denver. Well, as a, as a native Nebraskan, I have an affinity for Colorado. We used to go out there and ski and do all that stuff. Uh, and of course, my old seminary buddy, my old friend, who's now Bishop of Lincoln, Jim Conley, was an auxiliary there in Denver for a while. He was in yeah. And that was a yeah. nice uh, interview you had with him recently. So. Yeah. Great. great guy. Great guy. But anyway, uh, yeah, well, good luck with I, I'm, I'm this is a, I'm I'm working on some article ideas with regard to um, what I perceive to be a kind of demoralization in the church these days. And, and so I'm, I'm trying to collect statistics and, I, and anecdotes about, you know, vocations being, I hear all over now that you're not the only person to say vocations are down worldwide, not just nationally uh, over the past 10 years. And of course the temptation is simply, well, it's Pope Francis. Well, I'm not certain that's true. Uh, he might be. I think the causes are probably multifocal. They are. But I mean, yeah. I have to say, when I had a, a massive conversion back to the Catholic Church and I met Charles Shapu and I started reading John Paul. I mean, it was just yeah. like it was the age of giants. Graham yeah. Garansky who was my first spiritual director. It was just like these guys were absolutely um, the most inspiring men I'd ever met in my entire life. And whatever you want to say about the situation, we have we have really good bishops like Conley and Aquila. But the men, I don't see the men just inspired into greatness in the same way that we all just kind of did. And oh. you're not going to have the self reliance that my generation had, the John Paul II generation, we're going to save the church. They're not, they're, they're much more humble and honest. And, I, and I'm and i so grateful for that, but they need. I will. Yeah, I, I think this is important. And, and I will leave this to it. The, the, I, I want younger people listening to this to understand just how profoundly inspiring Pope John Paul was uh, for many younger people listening to this, maybe the only memories they have of john paul is, is is the old frail man you know with parkinson's you know and so on uh, I, my first year in seminary was 1978 and that was the year he was elected pope i cannot communicate enough how unbelievably inspiring he was to an entire generation of, of young seminarians and young sisters uh, going into female religious life and to just lay people in general just this explosion of enthusiasm for the church, that whole JP2 generation of Catholics. And I see that waning now. I do see that dissipating. And I actually see a concerted effort to almost dismantle the legacy of John Paul, which I think is very, very concerning. But maybe that's a, a, a podcast subject for another day. Yeah. Right. Anyway, I, well, let's not end on a negative note. I just say, get, get Father Neppel's book. Uh, and I, 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 
really had a great time this past summer, those three days doing the talks to your Companions of Christ uh, group. I uh, wish I could have been out there with you, but due to inner ear reasons, I could not. Uh, and, and so it's just great. Finally, you know, talking. What well, maybe one of these days we'll meet in person, Father. Maybe yes, one of these. It's gonna days. happen. I'm gonna show up at your place one of these days. You're gonna be like, I'm not home. I'm not home. Don't come. And I'm like, No, I'm coming. So. Uh, yeah, yeah, you should. I think the last time you were out here, I was out of town or something. I wasn't gonna be around. No, it's gonna happen. And I also want to say, you're the way we have to keep, especially the the, the communio theologians. Uh, I'm so honored to be a part of it. I mean, when Margaret Kurt invited me to this conference, and it's like I meet Hauser and I meet uh so many of your students and hear all about you i mean just like there's something that really is being reborn and and the torch is being carried and the second vatican council interpretation is at stake here and so yeah it is I just, it is i want to end with a note of gratitude to you for facilitating uh you are kind of at the center of this constellation and uh you're bringing a lot of people into relationship and in conversation so keep up the good work I'm going to invite you back. You're good for my ego or bad for my ego, depending on how you want to look at it. Hey, thanks again for coming on the show. We'll have to have a part two down the road. But for now, I, I bid you adieu. And, and thanks, everyone, for listening. So uh, thanks again, everyone.